Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about twelve, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him, except Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed, because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them 
and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About five thousand men were there. But he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Well, welcome. You have enjoyed the video, which, uh, I, you know, we'll, I'll talk later about, you know, The Chosen has a better video of all this, but that's okay. Because <laughs> there's backstory. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, so we, this is, this is again a lesson. Um, uh, believe it or not, I can't believe we're in session nine already, but this is a lesson that, uh, again, it's, there's so much here that I don't know if we'll ever even touch half of it uh, or even a portion of it. But I looked at this, Gary, and I told you I was going to start out with a joke. And when I looked at this in my notes, as I outlined it, I have two Oreo cookies and a feeding. <laughs> Because if you look at it, we've got basically three sections. This first hero or, or healing session which is, you know, we're, we'll talk about it. You know, we got a synagogue official that says, hey, my daughter's got a problem. And then in the middle of it, we've got a, a woman. So there's your Oreo cookie number one. And it goes back to. And, the... and goes, yeah, it goes back to. It. And, and then Oreo number two is we send the disciples out. And then all of a sudden we're over into uh, uh, Herod. Herod. Yeah, talking about, <laughs> talking about John the Baptist. And then. We come back and we get the bottom half of the Oreo cookie. And then we just go down the street and we feed 5,000 people. So, we, yeah. yeah, it's great. Uh, so, so, cookies, dessert first. Yeah, we get, two we get our two cookies <laughs> and good. fish and bread. So, so I'm going to put up real quick here a, a map or a Google Earth, really, uh, mm -hmm. because what, we, what we've got here is just some, some geographical markers. Uh, Jesus, when we left in session eight, was over here in Gersha. Uh, and we, by the text, we assume that he's heading back to Capernaum. And then we're going to get over uh, to, uh, uh, how do you say it? Bethsaida? Beth Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Yeah, you try to pronounce all the, sil the vowels somehow. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, Jesus is, did, did he take the boat over here? Who knows? Did he walk over here? Who knows? But, but he, we, we left him here. He's coming over here and then he's heading back over here. So I think it's always good to get at least, you know, uh, 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 an idea of what's going on here. So you've got that and now I'm going to take it off. <laughs> so you saw it quick and now it's gone. So, so we're, we're going to assume we're back in Capernaum. And we're, we're, we're on North Lake Galilee. There you go. And what's interesting is Jesus returns and the people are anxiously waiting for him. I mean, if you if you if you read that verse 40 in Luke chapter 8, the, the term and they were waiting for him is, is really the Greek is anxiously waiting for him. I mean, so they're waiting for him to come back. And we've got a dude who comes to Jesus, falls at his feet, and he has a 12-year-old daughter. Now, I'm going to hand it off to you for a second and say, okay, there's a lot to unpack of this official who is 
basically cl- coming to Jesus because if he is in Capernaum, there's been a lot of stuff that has happened, and especially a lot of stuff around this synagogue in Capernaum. So, much talk a little bit about our, this this official. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll start talking about the Capernaum, uh, like you said, uh, the Jesus in chapter four gets a bad reception in his hometown at the synagogue service. Uh, but then he goes to another synagogue service in that chapter, which is in Capernaum. And at that one, they're all amazed. Yeah, He, he got a fairly good reception. There's some uh, of Pharisees here and there in the intervening chapters that uh, put up, uh, you know, some fuss. But uh, the, they're not necessarily in Capernaum. Yeah. Uh, uh, though uh, maybe at Matthew's place, uh, that was for sure uh, one of the places where the the talk was uh, smack about Jesus and uh, you know hanging out with such uh, unsavory characters. But uh, that that wasn't at the synagogue necessarily. Yeah. And then uh, when he's like you said, when he's uh, returning, uh, there anxious, excited, and there's nobody more anxious than uh, Jairus or Yairus, if you were going to go back, because his name has Yar or God uh, in it. And uh, he is um, like the president of the board is probably one of the best uh, examples of, you know, putting it in a modern day context of a, of a congregation. Uh, he's a, a lay person. Uh, he's not one of the Pharisees or Sadducees necessarily or scribe. He's just somebody who's in charge of making sure things happen at the synagogue. And uh, here, this is a synagogue that, like I mentioned, Jesus uh, worshiped at, preached at, was well received at. And then in chapter seven, uh, this is the synagogue that was built by uh, the uh, centurion who's in charge of the Roman, uh, you know, cohort that's there in uh, Capernaum overseeing all kinds of things, uh, both legal matters as well as the uh, the uh, taxes and the civic program, civic uh, development. So building the synagogue, he pulled that in as one of his, and he evidently was a uh, someone who was attracted to the the Jewish uh, God in, in their worship. So uh, was considered a friend of the, the synagogue. So uh, this is all part of that group of people. So here's the synagogue president throwing yeah. himself at his feet. And I love the Middle Eastern culture atmosphere. I've probably said it before about this particular video, uh, the Lumo. Uh, it, it doesn't have the backstory, but it's, it's to just present how the gospel presents it. So uh, they, uh, but still the the Middle Eastern uh, flavor of uh, Jairus just throwing himself at his feet and kissing his hands and being emotional about uh, getting Jesus to come to his house. Uh, Jesus getting there and the mourners in the house uh, that are you know uh, making all the noise and waving their arms. Uh, very true to life of that Middle Eastern. Um, custom and uh so i'll I'll stop there because you may want to say more about gyrus yourself and about the the family and what's going on well um you know from my studies um digging into this a little bit because again we when we read through this uh, especially when we're trying to look up stuff you get stuck pretty quick and the two things that uh stuck out is this him being an official of the synagogue is a big deal because he is the only one meaning like you say he's the he he's it you know there's not like two officials of the synagogue he is the, that so it's a it's a big thing there and it's his his only daughter and uh, I didn't get into the Greek all that much, but uh, in the one commentary I read, it, it really came into, it's not only his only daughter, but the way the Greek comes, it's his only child. Mm-hmm. Now, I thought it was interesting, too, when we think back to the story of when um, Jesus is in Peter's, uh, I think it was Peter's house, and 
you had the four dudes and, and their friend lowered down and you had the synagogue uh, Pharisees, which this guy's not, you know, not a Pharisee or anything, but they're sitting there, you know, questioning Jesus right away. Well, you know, this is all part of that same sort of cohort, uh, you know, that all of a sudden this guy whose daughter is, is, you know, on the brink of death and actually, you know, dies. Uh, sorry, gave that away. Uh, <laughs> you know, he he's part of that same cohort, which, you know, a few chapters uh, behind were like attacking Jesus and, and who's who's he to forgive sins. So think about that. It, it, you know, what a change of heart when you really need somebody, <laughs> you know, you're going to go to him. I mean, so that belief in Jesus and the healings that he's done there in Capernaum and around the area uh, obviously convinced, uh, how did you say it? I like the way you said it, Jaira? Yairus. 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 Oh, I like that. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, it's a, you know, what, what a humbling um, experience this was for this official to come to Jesus with all the background that's gone on and, and humble himself and say, I need you, uh, you know, I, and obviously I believe in you, uh, come heal my daughter. That's, that's huge. The depth there is huge. And, and so he, there's a crowd and he, you know, I can imagine this happening basically on the dock, you know, just outside the dock. And now they're walking to this guy's house. And we get this break in the story. <laughs> and, and this is where the chosen was great because the chosen, you know, Peter's there with him and Jesus is walking through this throng of people. They're, they're, they're touching. I mean, everybody's bumping into him. It's like, it's like going to, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, a rock concert or something and you're down in the mesh pit and, and people are all over you. And Jesus is like, who touched me? And, and, and Peter's like, you know, you can just see Peter going, what are you talking about? Yeah, Every he didn't touch you. Yeah. <laughs> everybody's crowding around you because it talks about that, that, you know, they're pressing in on him and everything. And, and, and Jesus is like, no, no, I felt power leave me. So uh, uh, talk a little bit about it because the, the cloak's a big deal. Um and, you know, go ahead, you know, I'll give it to you. What, what's going on here? This is crazy. Mm. Well, uh, this woman uh, is uh, a social reject yep. in the sense that because she has this ongoing bleeding uh, that's uh, similar to uh, menstrual bleeding, but it's just all the time. Uh, she is, according to the Old Testament, during that kind of bleeding, you are unclean, you are an untouchable. And uh, you, even if you touch somebody else, you make them unclean. So it, it was uh, like uh, you just didn't interact with her, you didn't touch her. Uh, so she may be somebody that, you know, was not, uh, hadn't been touched by anybody and hadn't touched anybody herself for uh, quite a while, or at least uh, those who cared about that. Uh, it's interesting that her uh, disease began 12 years before and the daughter uh, that uh, uh, Jairus is 12 years old. So at the birth of Jairus's daughter was the start, which is a joy, uh, is the start of this woman's uh, pain and a uh, painful situation. But uh, she, so to be in a crowd like that, that was really risky for her because if uh, she was really noticed, uh, she may have had her veil over her face so nobody could see and uh, uh, who she was because they'd be possibly afraid to touch uh, contact her. And then what does she do? She touches Jesus, which... Uh, that would make him unclean, and uh, but it, what she does is touches the the translations are often the hem or the the fringe of his garment. Uh, the word that's used 
is one that can be used just for a hem. And actually, in uh, uh, the well, uh, the uh, in the movie, uh, I don't think I don't know that we took that picture, but in the movie, she touches his uh, sleeve, and if you remember, so it's just the edge of the sleeve. But here, uh, the word is also used uh, in the Greek for the fringes of a Jewish robe. Now, this is a modern. Uh, look at it and that uh, nowadays if you like you see people praying at the uh, wailing wall or if you were to go to a more of an orthodox uh, Jewish temple uh, and see people worshiping you will see them uh, with their prayer shawl which this is and uh, there's a tassel uh, or a fringe uh, for tassels uh, on uh, the garment and uh in jesus day this these tassels were on their outer robe uh, there were days in which jews had to wear them inside as uh, like an underwear uh they kept doing it because if you look at numbers and uh, deuteronomy it's a reminder uh of their uh, following god's law so every time they got dressed you said certain prayers and using that that uh, that uh, uh, fringed garment to uh, say I'm I'm clothing myself with God's law and I plan to live that law uh, every day, and so uh, she she could have just touched the fringe, uh, which you know would be like a very that outermost outer hem of that garment. And uh, in Jesus' day, they wore them on the outside. So uh, if he was, this could indicate not only what she did and what she touched, but it would also indicate Jesus' piety uh, and his Jewish piety. If it was the French, uh, the word, the same word in Matthew is used when they um, criticize the uh, Jewish, uh, certain of the Pharisees for multiplying the fringes on their garment and i don't know if the, I, I think i included a picture there with uh, several fringes on the side of a of a prayer shawl did did i include that one too uh it's, yeah let me grab uh, yeah. I, th I think this is what you're talking about here Phil, it? yeah that's the one uh th that was something jesus was criticizing them about because they were almost like bragging how holy they were with all the, the fringes on it. Uh, I, I found it interesting that they still have that as an option too for people <laughs> on their prayer, but there, there's probably a certain prayer uh, ritual that goes with it uh, that uh, I'm not remembering at the moment, but uh, that that's uh, anyway, uh, that's that fringe. And uh, so Jesus is keeping his Jewish identity uh, and, Possibly putting that garment on in the, every morning uh, as he uh, gets dressed and and praying that the prayer about keeping the God's ways and God's will. So uh, it might be an insight into Jesus's own prayer life and uh, you know spiritual life. Well, it's it's interesting detail, and you you alluded to it by her touching Jesus. She, uh, and I, I have the verse up here. If anybody is interested, you can go to Leviticus 15, 25 <laughs> and read all about it. But basically, she is unpure, unrighteous, you know, and by her touching him, she, he is now impu uh, unpure. All right. And it's interesting because we get the story that's going to come up uh, next where there's this simile going on when Jesus tells the disciples, when you leave a, a, a city and they haven't, you know, basically, you know, followed you, haven't treated you well, shake off the dust. Well, that is a way of making the land unpure, unrighteous. So we, we've got sort of these similes in the story. Um, but there's two things that are interesting. Uh, I, I, I'll say the one and then I'll let you sort of lead the other one. The first is what Luke leaves out from the longer story, which is from Mark. Okay. So in Mark chapter five, uh, uh, verse 21 through 43, Mark 
talks about that this woman has gone to many physicians and they haven't made it better. They've actually made it worse. And I'm, I'm thinking Luke out of professional courtesy <laughs> leaves that out. <laughs> I mean, so there's, there's, a, there's an interesting little side note there, but mm-hmm. the question I'm going to lead you into is Jesus is sitting there. Who touched me? Who did this? Who took power from me? And it's almost making this woman who has gone to great lengths publicly declare why she did it. Now, uh, I'll let you sort of talk about that, because why would Jesus make her publicly declare that she had been healed? Mm -hmm. well, I don't know that I'm going to answer that question, but uh, hopefully we will, <laughs> we will as, we, as I meander through, uh, related to the unclean and, uh, and clean uh, idea uh, in Jesus's ministry. And I, I did not, it's something now I'm thinking that would be a study in itself right there. Uh, Jesus basically has that reversing. That when you encounter Jesus, if you were unclean and you touched him, or you were unclean and he touched you, like the leper, leper, yeah, uh, the lepers in the story, uh, you became clean. Yeah. It, the the and the power that left him yeah. was that power of holiness and righteousness that that clean cleansed them and healed them and made them. Uh, holy in that sense or uh lovable yeah uh, touchable uh that that changed their lives and so uh that i I think that's a big part of it he and he could feel that which is the amazing thing that there were a bunch of people there and a bunch of people brushing up against him but there was one person and so he wants to know and i i think he's drawing out of her uh, her public testimony right yeah. there uh, to say, because she was healed immediately. She knew it and she w- was able to proclaim that to everybody. She became clean in that sense. And, uh, you know, there's other rituals. Uh, he did send some other people to the priests or, or to the appropriate people to uh, make sure they were ritually clean in the law. But uh, she has to say, and he declares, your faith yes. has made you well. And so this component of Jesus' power and our faith in his power uh, to make the, that happen, uh, an amazing uh, story that uh, allows everybody there to uh, be a part of it. And uh, one thing that I want to add is he uses a term that ties us back into this story, but it actually ties us into earlier in chapter 8. What he says when he says, your faith has made you well, is he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. That's a family term. Uh, And just earlier, uh, you know, not a a dozen or a couple dozen verses earlier, he says, who's my family? Who's my mother? Who's my brother? Who's my sisters? In in a sense, who's who's my daughter? Uh, They're my family is those that hear the word of the Lord and do something about it and uh and do the will and the word of god and this woman did it and uh, he's proclaiming that and proclaiming that she's part of the family so uh, he's bringing her back into the family again uh and she's now a daughter and the story continues from there as they go uh as the the daughter of jairus uh story continues well, and it's, it, I'm, do, I'm trying to do a very, very quick word study, because if I'm looking at this correctly, and I may not be because I'm doing this as we're speaking, <laughs> um, I think, no, it's the same word. Okay. I, I was, I was, because uh, in the, in my uh, uh, interlinear that I'm looking at, uh, the, the word um, it, the, for daughter that Jesus is uses in verse f- uh, 48 is an endearment 
you, I think what you're, you're leading to, um, and I'm not sure, and I'm trying to do it and I can't do it very quickly is when the, they use the term daughter for the, the girl, uh, if it's the same term and, and I will have to do more study. I don't, I can't, I'm not, I'm not being able to do that real yeah. quick. You'd want to do the interlinear if you wanted to on 42, where, uh, it's the only daughter that's mentioned by, uh, by Luke, because then it'd be interesting. Because in forty nine, your daughter has died. Did the did they use the d- term of endearment, the the friends that came, or did they use more of just a uh, uh, more it, neutral? Uh, yeah, way of it, saying? It, 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 sometimes it's the same word, but it's the way you say it. And, and yeah, I, 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 suffix and or prefix. It's, I don't. I don't even want to go there because it's the yeah. it's the same strong numbering. But I, th- I think I think like you say with the Greek, there's something there because um, in in 48 uh, the the sense comes through uh, the Greek sense comes in endearment and then mm-hmm. in uh, 49 it, it does not. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't uh, don't want to go there. So I, so I got you. <laughs> so um, we get this that that wonderful episode and then. You you can just envision it, especially from the visit the the video. Now you get somebody coming again with this. Don't trouble the the, the teacher. It, just like the centurion, exactly like the centurion, when he was trying uh, to to have his servant healed. And again, that's a whole other story. But uh, yeah, the, you know, the 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 sandwich. Mm-hmm. Here of this entire chapter seven and chapter eight yep. uh, place of uh, the power of Jesus and uh, healing as well as with the dead. Yep. So, so now you get this, uh, you know, Jesus almost being mocked because the, these, these, these uh, people are coming. They're saying, don't bother your daughter's dead. Uh, you know, obviously very emotional, <laughs> you know, your daughter's dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. And Jesus is like, don't be afraid, you know, d- only believe she will be well. And, and, and basically he takes Peter, John and James into the house. They keep going, they get into the house and he, Jesus is like, stop weeping, you know, stop weeping. And they begin to mock him, laugh at him. Because yeah, they're the the girl died. Yeah. They already have the professional mourners there, yeah. uh, so they were fairly convinced themselves that uh, she was dead, and it was time to to bring them over. And uh, it, by the time they got through the crowd to to find Jesus uh, with the the woman and Jairus, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a done deal. So somebody comes over to the house and says, she's not dead. Yeah. Uh, or she's just asleep. They're like, yeah, right guy. Uh, and, and, you know, at, at a moment, I mean, it, it does seem uh, disrespectful because uh, mm-hmm. in like in any other, if you were at the funeral home or at the house when, you know, the coroner had shown up and they were ready to take the body and you just said, hey, they're not dead. Just hang on a second. Everybody's like, what's going on? Who does, who's this crazy person uh, think he is? And because uh, I've been there uh, as a pastor, I've been called when somebody's died at their home before the coroner got there or before the, the funeral home got there and you, you I sat there with the family for a while yeah. and if somebody came in and said oh he's he's not dead or she's not dead and especially a daughter like this now this oh, is a yeah. i got a 12 year old at home right now mm-hmm. and a granddaughter here and boy that hits home really close just thinking about this and even more so in at 12 years old in this culture she was uh able to be married Yep. Uh, all right. She she could start uh, her her whole uh, female uh, adult female life was right there at the beginning, yep. and uh, uh, William Barclay. If anybody has a William Barclay commentary, this is a great section that, that he writes about uh, and goes into more depth about the 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 sadness of this uh, mourning 
uh, M O R N I N G, the sunrise of her life, uh, where you know they should be celebrating and thinking about her uh, her adult life and having a child in the next couple of years, possibly. And uh, instead, uh, this is the end. It's yeah. the 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 sunset or the the dark night uh, for them. And so it's the dark night of the soul for these parents. And that's why Jairus is so, I mean, he still has the hope when Jesus yeah. says to do this, they go and he goes with them and the, and the mother and the father go in with them when they invite him to come in. Uh, there must be on their part, some expectation that, Hey, we know what's happened before. We know what happened with the centurion who built the synagogue that he's the synagogue leader of. Yeah. He saw, he knows what happened there and knows that, this could happen again and uh everybody else is just uh going on the the way we've always done it type of thing and i mean the thing that is interesting again we're we're looking at the luke account but when you look at the parallel account written by mark which is is, is longer yeah um, more detail uh, more detail actually edited this story <laughs> yeah yeah well and and you got to think um peter is in this tight group so Peter is telling Mark when Mark is writing the account. I mean, that's how that's what most people think that the gospel of Mark is, is Peter's account that Mark recorded. Uh, you know, we get we get this um, sort of touching thing where where he is speaking in Aramaic. Little girl, I say to you, get up, you know, arise and, and, and much more detail you know, much more detail uh, as far as the words go. And I mean, can you just imagine, uh, you know, there, there's six people in there right now, the, the girl, the mother, the father, Jesus, and then uh, Peter, John, and James. And he takes her little hand and, and says in that, you know, in Aramaic, I'm not even going to try to say Talaha Kom? I don't know. I can't speak Aramaic. Aditha <laughs> Kum is usually the... Yeah, well, that, that, yeah. it's much easier for you to say than me. Yeah, easy, easy to say. Oh, hey, Bean, what are you doing? <laughs> There's the cat in the, the show again. <laughs> well, I got my dog in the back. <laughs> uh, don't let them see each other, right? <laughs> uh, but, but anyways, it's, I mean, it's a precious moment. He's taking her hand. Take and, it's and the only time... In Luke's gospel, that he takes somebody's hand. Yeah, uh, and and the parents were amazed, and mm-hmm. and again, she, you know, he 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 thinks. I mean, this is this is someone that is uh, the compassion, because what does he do? He says she's probably hungry. Get get her something to eat. <laughs> I mean, who thinks of that? I mean, I just <laughs> raised this girl from the dead. You know, come on, cheer me on. No, no. Hey, she's probably hungry. You know, I mean, that, it, it, yeah. William Barclay again says it may not be just only for the daughter yeah. being hungry. It may be for oh, something yeah. for the mother to do. Oh, uh, sure. To, uh, to kind of gather her wits about herself because oh. she's been through the death, uh, the sickness, the death, and the mourning, and now. Uh, the shock of coming back, uh, and the so yeah. well, and, and again, uh, he, the, we end chapter eight with you know, the parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Well, obviously, that did they don't not have happen, to. <laughs> they, they, and well, and they don't have to because everybody else is going to know about it, and that word's going to spread without them saying a thing. <laughs> well, just, I mean. Think Even about just obeyed him. <laughs> think about the irony of this. Luke is recording the, these words that he instructed them to tell no one that happened. Well, wait a second. Luke knows what happened, so somebody had to tell him what happened. I mean, it's in the, it's in it's right. in all the synoptic gospels. So it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, everybody knew. Uh, <laughs> sure. Well, and if Luke was from this town or or uh, part of the you know, uh, the Capernaum scene, uh, if his boss, uh, built the synagogue, uh, he knew this family as well. So, uh, you know, all the connections are pretty amazing since, uh, uh, Matthew's from there. 
uh, he was the tax collector in Capernaum. And so this, there's a Capernaum contingent that's well, uh, Peter, Peter, James yeah. and John. They're all, they're all from there. They're right. all from there. And, and so, just to, just to clarify what, what you said in case somebody hasn't uh, sort of followed along and why would you not have followed along? Um, we, we <laughs> sort of, chapter seven. that's right. We, we sort of pushed to the fact that there's a high, there's a probability that Luke was the servant of the centurion that the centurion asked Jesus to heal. And Luke was, it was actually a follower of Jesus uh, prior to what we may think. Uh, so just to clarify that, if you did not understand any of that, go back and watch the other episode. So and, uh, I'll give a plug to, uh, is there life after, after acts with yeah. Luke uh, or for Luke? Because uh, we did a whole, uh, a whole session on uh cat just really wants to get in it usually doesn't want to be part of this <laughs> well see obviously the dog is used to me talking <laughs> <laughs> he's asleep <laughs> i must be that boring uh, so i wanted to say uh, i wanted didn't want to get away from the film clip either because i found uh the the parents uh it, it's very subtle but the parents and the disciples are in the room, you just don't see them. The way they framed it with the doorway, uh, all you see is Jesus and the girl. But there's a point at which, and I don't think I took a picture of that, a uh, screen cap, but in the film, as you watch it, she looks backwards bo over both her shoulders. And that's where I believe the parents and the disciples are that are watching. But there uh, is this touching scene. I, I am so impressed actually with the way they did film this because um, th they slow everything down. Usually they're narrating and things are the action uh, of the gospels going on. And here between music and just silence, they slowed this story down in these, in this scene so that uh, uh, you might go to one of the other ones uh, where he's uh, this, this is where they're st uh, standing, I think. Uh, did I screen cap uh, where he just touches her hand, first of all? Oh, okay. let me. And, and if you don't have it, that's okay. Uh, well, I have, let me let me get that one up here. Hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in the order of the story unfolding, uh, he first just, it, it, the, the, the camera comes in and focuses on him uh, just tenderly with both of his hands yep. grabbing her hand and the the, her, the face covering like when you cover somebody's face uh, after they die is still on at this point in the scene uh, but the the cinematography and the direction of, of just focusing on that compassion like you yes. said and then uh, uh, when she's the next one is when she's still lying in the bed and he's helping her sit up uh, again uh, yeah, using uh, his hands again to uh, personally be uh, touching and uh, caring for her and helping her in. Can you imagine being 12 years old and having this experience, or let alone, you know, 62 or, or uh, 22 or whatever else age? Uh, wow. Uh, and then, uh, then that final uh, shot that we showed. Uh, which was uh, them standing there and he's just standing there kind of enjoying the moment with her and enjoying her reaction to it. And uh, like I mentioned, she kind of looks back behind her to everybody else that's in the room with her and, but still looking at Jesus. And uh, I just love the, the, uh, the way they emphasized uh, the, the tenderness of, of this healing in this moment uh, for everybody involved. So what a great, a great little, you know, it's sandwich. Yeah. Now we could have spent the whole time on that. Unfortunately, we've got a couple. And we more. probably did. <laughs> we probably <laughs> did. It's right. So, so we go on to this next story, which is, I mean, we are seeing Christian mentorship, discipleship in action right now because we go into uh, uh, chapter nine and Jesus calls the 12 together. And, and we have gotten, you know, in the previous chapters where he has named the 12, 
and now he is calling and them that's, together. That's out of a larger group. That's out calling. of a larger group. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and this is the first calling uh, in this uh, this set of things because this is what starts uh, chapter nine, and then in chapter ten, uh, he's going to call seventy two by two. Yeah. So it's a fascinating uh, uh, mentoring program where he's first working with these the the twelve and uh, then broadening that program uh, with the seventy. So you've got if they're different uh, people, you've got 82 uh, leaders he's mentoring in these two chapters uh, right there that uh, indicate uh, an, a fascinating movement of people. Uh, and then there's the women that we mentioned at the beginning of chapter eight that are part of it too. So, uh, wow. <laughs> he's got like a, like a centurion. He has... Uh, centurions had 80 to 100 people that they were in charge of and that they were on a campaign with uh, or on a mission with. And he has this mission of 80 to 100 people. Uh, and it's going to be 120 in Jerusalem when they uh, are, are down there in the upper room, uh, you know, later on, way later on. But uh, it, it's a fascinating kind of number to think about in uh, the, a movement uh, of leadership. And sometimes I'm, I'm sitting here looking desperately and I can't find it of the uh, basically the mentoring square. Uh, mm-hmm. And I wish I could find it. Uh, well, just say it. <laughs> well, uh, I wish I had the visual. I, ha- I have a great visual where basically it's, you know, oh. the, the calling. You follow me. We walk together is the next square. And then the, 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 the third square is you go. I'm here. And then the fourth is is launch, and you you keep repeating, and this is what and we're I, seeing. Yeah, I, I've learned it. Uh, you come with me, and I'm going to do it. You watch me. You watch, yeah. And, and then the next one is I'm going to go with you. You yeah. do it, and I'm going to watch you. Yeah. And then the third is you're on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you do it, and then a, another stage to that is you find the person you're going to mentor. And take them with you to watch you. Yeah. And uh, Jesus is uh, geniusly doing exactly that. And and he gives these, uh, and and that's the example that we're seeing here. And he gives these instructions. You know, hey, take nothing. You trust in what I've just the power that I've just given you. Now I'm paraphrasing there, and you know, wherever, whatever house you stay in, you know, until you leave, yada, yada, yada. And if, if, if they have not received, you shake off the dust. Okay. And, and that's, that's again, showing that would make the, the, the ground unclean, you know, as, as and it parallels back there. And so these guys are, are going out, they're preaching the kingdom of heaven within the power that Jesus gave. They're able to heal, you know, they're able to cast out demons. Um, you know, they have authority over demons. So, I mean, it's a, I mean, this is really, really cool. We could spend a lot more time on it. Um, there but, is a step missing as I'm thinking about uh, it. And it, it, it so speculating or, or, or pondering about why that step's missing. And that is, uh, I'm going to go with you and uh, you do it. Uh, that kind of middle step. He's just sending them out now to do it uh, on a on a field trip instead of he can't go with all of them. He can't go with all twelve necessarily. Uh, and it well, there's no stories in the gospel uh, where he's said uh, uh, I'm going to go with you and watch uh, do yeah. it. But he is saying go do it and come back. This is a temporary assignment. It, it's going to be a permanent assignment. There we go. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way to go. But he's, uh, I think, uh, just pondering it for a moment, he's got time pressure here and that yeah. he he doesn't have the time to mentor all 12 or all 70 later on, one by one. Uh, he's So he's uh, shown them, they've seen how it works, and he's sending them out to into the field to say, okay, you've seen uh, what's, what has happened and what, what God has uh, possible to do with you. Uh, so 
uh, I send you with that same authority. And uh, it's a, a, I guess you call it a, a field experience, a field trip, yep. uh, a field uh, educational uh, component and uh, come back and let's talk about it. So in, well, and in that sense is able to, to mentor them further. Uh, again, it's it's not the the perfect uh, you know synergy, but it, it right. sort of helps. I do you watch, right? I do you help, and really, what you've got is it did help. You know, you do I help, and and, and him giving them the power is is really this sort of D three, and then I celebrate you. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. poof, you go, uh, and. and, and and then, you know, like you say, there's 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 way more to this because I celebrate you. Now you are the I <laughs> and you got to go, you know, you do it again, you know, so right. you, you create that cycle. So and and again, this is an example of the Great Commission, you know, go and make disciples, teaching them what I've taught you. It's like I've, I, I think I've. Hopefully, don't have to answer for this in heaven, but uh, I say it's the greatest multi-marketing uh, level scheme that there is out there, and and you know I could be in trouble for that one. So, so spreading the news. There That's you go. Awesome. So we we get news. we get this, and we get Jesus saying, "Go into these villages." And again, if you, if you're thinking about where we're at, uh, if he's in Capernaum. He, he's sending them out into, into that upper Gal- Galilee, Sea of Galilee region. And then all of a sudden, we shift focuses. You know, we shift from Capernaum to wherever Herod the Tetrarch is. And we get this scene. And again, if you remember, one of the women was uh, one of Herod's servants. Okay, so Luke knew this woman. And so we're getting now a split screen. Disciples are out doing their stuff. Jesus is in Capernaum. And now we get this little scene from, you know, Herod, where he's hearing what's going on. And he's fearful because he's like, Oh, this is John the Baptist come from the dead. Oh, this is this is Elijah. Oh, this is a prophet of old. And then we find out in Luke's how Luke portrays it that oh, you know, Herod knows that it's not John the Baptist because he killed him. You know, uh, so why don't we talk about this? Talk about this scene that we get uh, in the. I mean, it's amazing because we're we're in. The courtroom. We're in the, the 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 temple, or not the temple, but Herod's ruling palace, and we're getting Herod's viewpoint on what's going up in the Sea of Galilee region with this guy named Jesus. Absolutely. Um, the, there's uh, uh, different places at different times. Uh, of course, there were the Herodian palaces already that are kind of famous. But uh, th- there's uh, places in Galilee uh, because he is tetrarch. He doesn't have the whole uh, place as king. He, they specifically, when Herod, his father died, didn't name anybody king. Uh, eventually, that'll happen again, but not to uh, the, these sons. And uh, uh, this is Herod Antipas the first. And uh, he may be in on the Lake Galilee in Tiberias, or uh, uh, people have speculated Caesarea Philippi. Uh, any number of places he could be hanging out in the in the north. And uh, but he hears about this. This is the buzz is going on, and I don't think there's any mistake that uh, the placement of this story, though the connection isn't made other than the context, that it's after Jesus sends out his mentor, mentees, his protégés, and in a, on a leadership campaign yep. that uh, Herod, uh, Herod takes note and wants to go see what's going on. It says, I love that line. It's only Luke. And, you know, Herod Antipas kept trying to see him. So uh, 
my guess is he's going out there in disguise. Yep. You know, he's he's like heading out there uh, where <laughs> Jesus might be in the Galilean area, uh, and on Lake Galilee, to, and it, going in peasant garb yep. uh, and uh, trying to see him uh, that way. And uh, and you could see there uh, Tiberius is uh, like in the middle of the west coast of uh, the Sea of Galilee there. And Caesarea Philippi way north. Uh, my guess is it's more in that area down on the Galilee uh, that uh, that he's hanging out on. And, and of course, Sephorus is uh, over just north of Nazareth. This map doesn't have Sephorus, but Sephorus was another Roman city that uh, at one time was the capital, and now Tiberius was the capital. So, but they were still both very important places. Uh, uh, for the Roman administration uh, of Galilee. So, uh, you know, it's anyway, uh, we're, we're in the inside. We're, we're getting the, the straight dope on uh, what Herod's, uh, like you said, saying he's per, he's greatly perplexed at the very be- the first sentence of this story because of what everybody was saying. And interestingly enough, later in this chapter, uh, we don't hit it in this session. It'll be in the next session. This same panoply of people or, or suspects about who Jesus is will come up again. When Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say I am? And well, it's almost this exact same group of people. Uh, this is the buzz uh, of who Jesus is. And uh, they answer a, 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 a further answer. Uh, as Peter does, uh, to say, you're Messiah. Yep. And uh, uh, n- nobody dared tell uh, Herod Antipas that that answer, evidently, <laughs> when they answered the question, because uh, it's not in that, uh, not in that uh, selection of uh, suggestions made to him. But uh, uh, again, fascinating that he kept trying to see him. I uh, wonder if he never got to, or uh, but he or he, he just kept seeing him. Uh, yeah. It doesn't tell us that. It just says he kept trying. Yeah. So I mean, you know, again, it's just it, it's just another interesting part of the message that Jesus, who is sitting there saying, "Don't tell anybody," <laughs> and then the the next little story is. I've heard <laughs> of what's going on and yeah. everybody has heard of what's going on and they're trying to figure out, you know, is it John the Baptist risen from the dead? Is it Elijah? Is it a prophet of old? And, and again, it, to me, it's funny because you get that coming right after Jesus says, don't tell anybody that I just, you know, raised from the dead, this 12 year old girl. I mean, mm-hmm. And I've just sent my disciples out, given them power to 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 really preach the kingdom of God. <laughs> I mean, it just the humor of it all um, is is amazing. And so, sort of going on, uh, the disciples come back. They the apostles return. They give them an account. And wow, interestingly enough, you get this, and he withdraws. By himself to a city called uh, Bethsaida, or, 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 and he. So that's weird. They come back, and he withdraws by himself. But everybody knows that he withdraws by himself. So the crowds are aware of this. Follow him, <laughs> and all of a sudden. He's out in this wilderness, and uh, let me put this, the the map back up here because even when you look at it today, there's nothing. Um, this is where they think. So Capernaum is here. This is where they think he went because what's going to happen is the the next episode, this uh, feeding of the five thousand, is going to ha- happen out here. And you can see even today on Google Maps, there's there's no development, there's no city, there's no village. I mean, it's all 
empty farmland with the Jordan River coming in and dropping off into the Sea of Galilee here. Uh, there's nothing. <laughs> He's trying to get away. He's trying to get out of the, at that point, the metropolis <laughs> of Caperna and heading out here. And, and it's, I, I see it as a, a time that it, it's only after the apostles have returned and given their accounts. So, that, so they've had the, the debriefing yep. of this mentoring uh, field trip. And uh, they've been out there on their own uh, for what, how many days? And they're, they, they come back and tell the stories. And when it's all said and done, Jesus, uh, it's, it's, it's time out for him yep. to say, okay, Lord, what's next? Uh, to pray about uh, how things went uh, and this, this whole thing and, and to be in touch with the Father to keep that, uh, keep his uh, head right and, and in the right place as well as to be listening to, to the Father's will about what's next. And then uh, all of a sudden, like I said, uh, couldn't uh, really stay alone for too long. No. And, and he gets people, he, he used to be going places to seek people. Now he doesn't have to go anywhere because the people, the people are coming, coming to him. In fact, he has to go to go on to the next place. So he's not stuck in one place. Well, I mean, just, just look here what we've got. So, uh, you know, he's here in Capernaum. He's coming over here. The Sermon of the Mount took place over here, where where the the, the pigs fell off the cliff is over here. Mary of Magdalene's over here. Tiberius is over here. He's come over here. Everybody's coming to him, mm-hmm. you know. So everybody in this these regions here are coming to him out in the middle of nowhere, and they want to be healed. And he's healing people because that's what we say. You know, he began speaking to him about the kingdom of heaven and curing those who needed healing. And then it's like sun is starting to set and the 12 come to him and they say, you got to send these guys, these guys back to their villages. You got to get them out of here because we can't feed them. And you know what happens when people get hungry? They get mad. (laughs) And so (laughs) the disciples are like, let them go back. And and Jesus, who had empowered them, had sent them out on the mission. They came back and they're and, and he just looks at him and says, you give him something to eat, <laughs> you know, and it's like it's this test. You know, I think it's a test of his disciples faith because he has endowed them with power. They have gone out and preached the kingdom of heaven. They're in this remote place where he's been teaching, curing, and they're like, get him out of here, God. Just get him out. And he's like, you feed him. That'd be awesome. And, and what do they do? They, they look at their stash <laughs> and they put it all together. And well, uh, we got five uh, loaves and I love the loaves that yep. Middle Eastern flavor of the, yep. the video is one of the big uh, pieces of flatbread that uh, you would pull out as a loaf and uh, the, the fish, uh, two fish, uh, you know, uh, uh, those fish weren't like huge tuna that you could feed the family with. They were uh, <laughs> each one of those fish was just uh, a little bite uh, here and there uh, necessarily. Uh, so it didn't start with much and they were they their supplies were down they they weren't, they weren't going to feed the 12 let alone uh you know any more that are around and uh so uh, what does he do you know uh he has them recline or sit to eat in groups of 50 each so he's kind of organizing it. He's kind of well, let's let's get a hold of the the crowd mentality and uh, let's let's organize this thing. And so he's got them sitting in in uh, you know groups of people, and then they uh, begin to to uh, pass food out. And there's no lack of food. Uh, and this is one of those where uh, I can go either way. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm one to believe in the supernatural power of Jesus, but uh, another way to see the miracle would be he, they started with their you know five loaves and seven fish and started to just pass it out and say we're not eating this 
it, you have it. And it was pretty common for people to carry food with them anyway in their little sack that they wore with the oh, yeah. uh, shoulder strap. And they bring dried fish, uh, loaf, uh, uh, or figs, you know, various things that you needed to eat. <clears throat> and if everybody started to share what they had, that's a miracle of the heart where they they had people instead of saying, hey, I, I brought my lunch. What, what about you? Yeah, uh, I got enough for me. Uh, what about you? It was uh, in, in Mark's gospel. This story takes place right after Herod's uh, banquet. So yeah. there's this contrast of Jesus's banquet yep. where everybody's sharing what they have. And Herod's banquet, where they're chopping off John the Baptist's head uh, in the selfish, uh, you know, kind of more than enough banquet of, uh, uh, I guess we could call it sleazy. Oh, I'll just use that term. That's good enough right there. So uh, this contrast of the kingdoms of the earth and the kingdom of heaven uh, right there. And so if, whether it's uh, supernatural and, and Jesus is doing it right there and just passing it out from what what he's got there or whether everybody else starts to follow suit and passes it out or both uh they, they what they do they picked up more than they started with they pick up 12 i'm going to go back to my uh numbers in the scripture again they started with seven pieces of food three plus four uh God, uh, the Trinity three and four of the four corners of the earth. So it's kind of heaven and earth together. And then 12, three times four, uh, they end up with 12 baskets for each one of the apostles to carry out. So uh, it, it, God is good and uh, d does infinitely more than we can ever ask for or imagine, as Paul talks about in Ephesians. So I'll, I'll let you give your... Well, I don't know. I don't know if there's more to, to I mean, there's more to say, but I don't know if there's more that we can really say, you know, with, with the time that we've got. But it's like you look at these stories and, and we've got this this healing that went on, two different healings. One is an act of faith. Well, they're both acts of faith. One is an act of faith and one is an act of Jesus, but they're, they're both acts of faith. We've got these disciples, the apostles being endowed with power. We got this look at Herod, understanding what's going on and trying to figure it out. You got the disciples coming back, Jesus going out uh, away from it and everybody coming to follow him. And, and this miraculous, however you want to say it, miraculous feeding. And it is, it's just this, this world against world this kingdom against kingdom this kingdom of god which is mentioned over and over again in this in this uh little passage that we're studying today and this kingdom on earth of man that you get a glimpse of uh with herod at at his at his palace trying to figure out what the heck's going on i wonder if he tried to see him in bethsaida well, I wonder if we got be... to eat at the banquet, but we don't know that. We don't know. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so it's just it's just amazing. And, and you know, as we end this lesson and we think about going forward and, uh, you know, we 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 go on to the rest of chapter nine and, uh, the, you know, the rest of chapter nine is really that declaration of whom do you think I am? Whom do people think I am? This question, you know, this question that's really the 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 big part of it, and uh, you know, the end part of it is let me just show you who I am <laughs> at, at, at the Mount of Transfiguration, and and that is taking us just a little bit north, you know, uh, you know, and and it really. What's interesting about that is it's taking us a little bit north and, and it's taking us to the farthest point to Caesarea Philippi, but it's going to draw us down to what is going to be the crucifixion. Uh, well, because of the journey to Jerusalem, which starts in chapter nine, yep. uh, as he sets his face to Jerusalem, uh, that mission that the transfiguration seems to be the convincing moment where he knows uh, what God 
as planned for him at the time, uh, it, it starts that uh, whole the rest of the story for Luke, particularly the way he organizes the gospel of the journey or journeys yeah. uh, south uh, as they go south and get to Jerusalem one to three times, uh, yeah. depending on how you read it. We'll talk about that. When we get there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I was just going to speculate again, if, if Herod Antipas went to Bethsaida, let's say, and was and heard him there uh, in verse 11, it says, uh, Jesus began speaking about the kingdom of God. Uh, and that may have turned him off right there. Kingdom. Huh? Oh. What are we talking about? That's I'm the, I'm the guy that's the leader of this kingdom, and uh, they might not have called me king, but I, that's what I want because he. It's known that he wanted that title, yeah. uh, and so uh, he might have left right then and didn't get in on the on the feast. Uh, you know, thinking, "Hey, I've heard enough," because this is also the same herd that killed John and that were, is going to meet Jesus again. Oh, he's going to meet him. He will he will get to see him? He will get to see him at that point. Yep. So I mean, uh, just packed full of amazement um, mm-hmm. as we as we go through here. So um, that's really it. I mean, I'm telling you, there's so much more that we could dig out of these these three episodes if you want to look at it that way. But I mean, that just gives you a good feel for what's going on and the movement that is is going on uh which we'll talk about more and more as 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 we go through luke there's this movement and this movement's pushing us to the cross um and we've we've already seen a little bit of salvation (laughs) you know in the in these stories so wonderful well um i guess the only thing that's left to do is to end in prayer (laughs) you want to pray today you know what? Now let's not break the habit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got a good routine going here. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm humbled, but uh, I'll, 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 st- I'll struggle through. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Lord, for, uh, thank you, Father, for this day and for the, the words of the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke particularly, and uh, the insight into your interventions into our lives, whether you find us throwing ourselves at your feet, onto our knees, asking for things, old things and small things in prayer. Uh, for healing, for life change, uh, for others, for our children, for our friends. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you will listen and always respond somehow, someone, in love, particularly. Uh, We thank you for showing us the growth we can have in discipleship by uh, not just sitting, listening, watching, but knowing that Jesus said it's those who hear the word and do it that become your people. And that we just read about people who not only heard your word, but who responded by living it. And making a difference and being sent out to other places, other towns, other villages, other homes to proclaim, to talk about, to uh, reveal, to activate in, in action the kingdom of God as healing happens, as lives change, as people become clean and transformed and saved as their faith uh, makes that transition to wanting to know more about you. So, Lord, how do we serve you? How do we grow as a disciple? What's our next step in your mentoring process? We pray that you'll show us in in meaningful and practical ways in the next days of this week and in the days ahead in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. And we'll see you next week for the conclusion of chapter nine. Until then, God bless. Thanks, Chris. God bless.